Hi everyone, this is Daryl and welcome back to Book Odyssey. Back by popular demand is 2022 sci-fi book releases Smash or Pass. The rules are the same as last year. I'll read the blurb to a selection of science fiction books that are going to be released next year and I'll decide if I will smash it or pass it. If I decide to pass before I finish reading the blurb then I'll just stop reading, pass it and move on. Because as always, like life, there is no room for grey area. Love or hate only, yes or no. I feel like this could be a drinking game. Like last year, I got these books from the Good Read Can't Wait Sci-Fi Fantasy of 2022 list, which I'll link to below. There are around 250 books on this list, so once again to narrow it down, I did a preliminary scan of the blurb to see if it looked interesting. Other than the brief scan, I'm reading each of these cold. We have potentially 29 exciting sci-fi books to look forward to next year, and you can find links to these in the description. So let's get smashing, or oh, passing. Okay, so number one on the list is Untitled. Good start, <laughs> joking. This is the seventh book in the Murderbot Diaries. If you guys follow me on Goodreads, you'll know that I've been smashing through the Murderbot Diaries this year, and I am looking forward to the seventh instalment. There's no blurb for this one, but I did a quick search for a Murderbot Diaries blurb, just to give you a hint of what it's about. The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells is a series concerning a violent, self-hacking robot searching for the meaning of life. All systems read, the first book in the series received the Hugo, Nebula and Locus Awards. It's a great series, and if you've been reading this, no doubt you will be looking forward to this one too. So, this one is a smash. The next book I have is The Keiju Preservation Society by John Scalzi. When COVID-19 sweeps through New York City, Jamie Gray is stuck as a dead-end driver for food delivery apps. That is, until Jamie makes a delivery to an old acquaintance, Tom, who works at what he calls an animal rights organisation. Tom's team needs a last minute grunt to handle things on their next field visit. Jamie, eager to do anything, immediately signs on. What Tom doesn't tell Jamie is that the animals his team cares for are not here on Earth. Not our Earth, at least. In an alternate dimension, massive dinosaur-like creatures named Keiju roam a warm and human-free world. They are the universe's largest and most dangerous panda, and they're in trouble. It's not just the Keiju Preservation Society who found their way to the alternate world. Others have too, and their carelessness could cause millions back on Earth to die. Smash! I'm a fan of John Scalzi because he is such an accessible sci-fi writer, and I can almost hear his tone of voice while writing this. I can imagine it to be very funny, so this is definitely something that I will be keeping an eye on. Number three is Goliath by Tochi I'm so sorry for butchering this name and all of the names. Tochi Onibuchi? I'm going to provide a graphic so that you can actually see the names here because please just do not go from what I'm saying. So anyway. In the 2050s, Earth has begun to empty. Those with the means and privilege have departed the great cities of the United States for the more comfortable confines of space colonies. Those left behind salvage what they can from the collapsing infrastructure. As they eke out an existence, their neighbourhoods are being cannibalised. Brick by brick, their houses are sent to the colonies. What was once a home is now a quaint reminder for the colonists of the world that they wrecked. A primal biblical epic flung into the future, Goliath weaves together disparate narratives. A space dweller looking at New Haven, Connecticut as a chance to reconnect with his spiralling lover, a group of labourers attempting to renew the promises of Earth's crumbling cities, a journalist attempting to capture the violence of the street, a marshal trying to solve a kidnapping, into a richly urgent mosaic about race, class, gentrification, and who is allowed to be the hero of any story. Well, this one seems pretty interesting, I will have to say that. I do like the idea of the disparate narratives, seems quite interesting, so I'm going to go with a smash for this one. Tentatively. No, not tentatively, that's not allowed. Smash! Number four. Some Desperate Glory by Emily Tesh. All her life, Kier has trained for the day she can avenge the murder of planet Earth. Raised in the bowels of gay state... <laughs> Sorry, gear station? 
Gaia Station? Raised in the bowels of Gaia Station, alongside the last scraps of humanity, she readies herself to face the wisdom, the all-powerful reality-shaping weapon that gave the Majoda their victory over humanity. Kier is one of the best warriors in her generation, the sword of a dead planet, but when Command assigns her brother to certain death and relegates her to the nursery to bear sons until she's dying, she knows she must take humanity's revenge into her own hands. Alongside her brother's brilliant but seditious friend and a lonely, captive alien, she escapes from everything she's ever known into a universe far more complicated than she was taught, far more wondrous than she thought she could have imagined. A thrillingly pass. Number 5. Last Exit by Max Gladstone. Ten years ago, Zelda led a band of merry adventurers whose knacks let them travel to alternate realities and battle the black rot that threatened to unmake each world. Zelda was the warrior. Ish could locate people anywhere. Raymon always knew what path to take. Sarah could turn catastrophe aside. Keeping them all connected, Sal, Zelda's lover, and the group's heart. Until their final failed mission, when Sal was lost. When they all fell apart. Ten years on, Ish, Raymon, and Sarah are happy and successful. Zelda is alone, always travelling, destroying the rot throughout the US. When it boils through the crack in the Liberty Bell, the rot gives Zelda proof that Sal is alive, trapped somewhere in the Alts. Zelda's getting the band back together, plus Sal's young cousin June, who has a knack none of them have ever seen before. As relationships rekindle, the friends begin to believe they can find Sal and heal the worlds. It's not going to be easy, but they've faced worse before. But things have changed out in the Alts, and in everyone's hearts. Smash! Seems pretty good. Number 6, The Spare Man by Mary Robinette Cowell. Hugo Locus and Nebula Award winner Mary Robinette Cowell blends her no-nonsense approach to life in space with her talent for creating glittering high society in this stylish SF mystery, The Spare Man. Tessa Crane, one of the richest women in the world, is on her honeymoon on an interplanetary space liner, cruising between Earth and Mars. She's travelling incognito and is revelling in her anonymity. When someone is murdered and her husband is named as the prime suspect, to save him from the frame-up, Tessa will risk exposure and face demons from her past, even though doing so might make her the next victim. Smash! I like a good mystery, and it seems like it's kind of melding sci-fi with murder mystery on a cruiser. I'm thinking kind of Agatha Christie in space, maybe? Number 7, Hunt of the Stars by Jesse Mahillick. The critically acclaimed author of Polaris Rising takes readers on an exciting journey with the start of her brand new series about a female bounty hunter and the man who is her sworn enemy. Octavia would do anything to keep her tiny, close-knit bounty hunting crew together, even if it... Pass. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of over the bounty hunter trope. Number 8, Dead Silence by S.A. Barnes and Stacy Cade. Titanic meets The Shining. Okay, so obviously no one watched last year's video when I discussed my dislike of stuff meeting stuff. Let's carry on. Titanic meets The Shining. No, sorry, I'm out. Pass. Number nine. A Half-Built Garden by Rathana Emeris, a literary descendant of Ursula Le Guin. Okay, that is a big statement, a big, big statement, and a lot to live up to when you say that, so we'll just, we'll just see about that. We'll be the judge of that one. A literary descendant of Ursula Le Guin, Rathana Emeris crafts a novel of extraterrestrial diplomacy and urgent climate repair, bursting with quiet, tenuous hope and an underlying warmth. A half-built garden depicts a world worth building towards, a humanity worth saving from itself, and an alien community worth entering with open arms. It's not the easiest future to build, but it's one that just might be within reach. On a warm March night in 2083, Judy wakes to a warning of unknown pollutants in the Cheesecake Bay? <laughs> Chesapeake Bay? She heads out to check what she expects to be a false alarm and stumbles upon the first alien visitors to Earth. These aliens have crossed the galaxy to save humanity, convinced that the people of Earth must leave their ecologically ravaged planet behind and join them among the stars. And if humanity doesn't agree, they may need to be saved by force. The watershed networks aren't ready to give up on Earth. 
Decades ago, they rose up to exile the last corporations to a few artificial islands, escape the dominance of the nation states, and reorganize humanity around the hope of keeping their world livable. By sharing the burden of decision making, they've started to heal the wounded planet. But now corporations, nation states and networks all vie to represent humanity to these powerful new beings, and if one accepts the aliens offer, Earth may be lost. With everyone's eyes turned skyward, everything hinges on the success of Judy's effort to create understanding, both within the beyond and her own species. This seems very ambitious, um, and I would agree, very kind of Ursula Le Guin-esque. There are a couple of tropes in here that to me seem a little bit cliched, but I'm gonna smash this. But I'm gonna smash this because it has piqued my curiosity. We're doing pretty well so far. Good on 2022. So, number 10, we have Space Oddity by Catherine M. Valente. These are the voyages of the Starship Glam. Pass. 11. How We Go in the Dark by... I'm sorry again for butchering this name. How We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu. For fans of Cloud Atlas and Station Eleven, Ooh, I'm a big fan of Cloud Atlas. At least they didn't say Cloud Atlas meets Station Eleven. Props for that. For fans of Cloud Atlas and Station Eleven, a spellbinding and profoundly proficient debut that follows a cast of intricately linked characters over hundreds of years as humanity struggles to rebuild itself in the aftermath of a climate plague. A daring and deeply heartfelt work of mind-bending imagination from a singular new voice. Beginning in 2030, a grieving archaeologist arrives in the Arctic Circle to continue the work of his recently deceased daughter, where researchers are studying long-buried secrets now revealed in melting permafrost, including perfectly preserved remains of a girl who appears to have died from an ancient virus. Once unleashed, the Arctic plague will reshape life on Earth for generations to come, quickly traversing the globe, forcing humanity to devise a myriad of moving and inventive ways to embrace possibility in the face of tragedy. In a theme park designed for terminally ill children, a cynical employee falls in love with a mother desperate to hold onto her infected son. A heartbroken scientist, searching for a cure, finds a second chance at fatherhood when one of his test subjects, a pig, develops the capacity for human speech. A widowed painter and her teenage granddaughter embark on a cosmic quest to locate a new home planet. From skyscrapers to hotels for the dead to interstellar starships, Nagamatsu takes readers on a wildly original and compassionate journey spanning continents, centuries and even celestial bodies to tell a story about the resiliency of the human spirit, our infinite capacity to dream and the connective threads that tie us all together in the universe. Hell yeah, Smash! This is right up my sci-fi street. Definitely smash. So, number 12. We have Mindwalker by Kate Dillon. 18-year-old Sil Sarah is determined to die a legend. In the 10 years she's been rescuing imperiled field agents for the Syntax Corporation by commandeering their minds from afar and leading them to safely, Sil hasn't lost a single life, and she's not about to start now. She's got 12 months left on the clock before the supercomputer grafted to her brain kills her, and she's hell-bent on using that time to cement her legacy. Sil's going to be the only Mindwalker to ever pitch a perfect game, and even despite the deliberating glitches she's experiencing. But when a critical mission goes south, Sil is forced to flee the very company she once called home. Desperate to prove she's no traitor, Sil infiltrates the Analog Army, an activist faction working to bring Syntex down. Her plan is to win back her employer's trust by destroying the group from within. Instead, she and the army's reckless leader, Ryder, uncover the horrifying truth that threatens to undo all the good Sil's ever done. With her tech rapidly degrading and her new ally keeping dangerous secrets of his own, Sil must find a way to stop Syntex in order to save her friends, her reputation, and maybe even herself. Again, this one seems pretty good. I'm gonna smash this one. Smashy, smashy. Number 13, The Blue Beautiful World by Karen Lord. This near-future sci-fi novel imagines a post-climate disaster suffused by VR tech. Side note, I'm finding a theme among most of the sci-fi in this list. It seems to be having a climate edge. I thought that we'd 
kind of moved beyond cli-fi it was a bit of a thing a few years back and it seems it might be rearing its head again i'm not against cli-fi i just feel like it's been done does that make sense we've kind of moved on from cli-fi maybe anyway on a post-apocalyptic earth devastated by climate change <sighs> pass number 14 until the last of me by sylvain nouvelle this is the second book in Take Them to the Stars series. The first rule is the most important. Always run, never fight. Over 100 generations, Mia's family has shaped Earth's history to push humanity to the stars, making brutal, wrenching choices along the way. And now Mia finds herself about to help launch the first people into space. She can't take them to the stars, not quite yet, but with her adversary almost upon her, and with the future of the planet at stake, it's becoming clearer that obeying the first rule is no longer an option. For the first time since her line's first generation, Mia will have to choose to stand her ground, knowing that the overwhelming odds... Mm, pass. Not really gripping me. Number 15. Manhunt by Gretchen Felker Martin. Why the last man meets girl with all the gifts. In Gretchen Felker Martin's Manhunt, an explosive post-apocalyptic novel that follows trans women and men on a grotesque journey of survival. Beth and Fran spend their days traveling the ravaged New England coast, hunting feral men and harvesting their organs in a gruesome effort to ensure they'll never face the same fate. Robbie lives by his gun, and one hard-earned motto, other people aren't safe. After a brutal accident entwines the three of them, this found family of survivors must navigate murderous turfs, a sociopath billionaire bunker brat, and awkward relationship dynamics, all while outrunning packs of feral men and their own demons. Pass. Number 16, The Genesis of Misery by J.Y. Yang. A retelling of Joan of Arc's story given a space opera giant robot twist. It's an old familiar story. A young person hears the voice of an angel saying they have been chosen as a warrior to lead their people to victory in a holy war. But Misery, her name is Misery. Oh God, no wonder she's doomed. But Misery Namaki knows they are a fraud. Raised on a remote moon colony, they don't believe in any kind of God. Mm, pass. Number 17, The Book of Sand by Theo Clare. Outlines of several once hostile cities shimmer on the horizon. Now empty of inhabitants, their buildings lie in ruins. In the distance, a group of people, a family, walk towards us. Ahead lies shelter, a shuck, the family call home, and which they know they must reach before the light falls, as to be out after dark is to invite danger and almost certain death. To survive in this alien world of shifting sand, they must find an object hidden in or near water but other families want it too, and they are willing to fight to the death to make it theirs. It is beginning to rain in Fairfax County, Virginia, when Mackenzie Strathy wakes up, an ordinary teenage girl living an ordinary life, except the previous night she found a sand lizard in her bed, and now she's beginning to question everything around her, especially who she is. Two very different worlds featuring a group of extraordinary characters driven to the very limit of their endurance in a place where only the strongest will survive. I'm going to pass this one, basically because the blurb didn't really tell me much about it, about what was going on, um, and what it did say didn't really hook me. Number 18, The Principle of Moments by Esme Jacami Pearson. In self-defied Emperor Trakin's brave new galaxy, humans are not citizens. Instead, they are labourers indentured to the Empire, working to repay the billions in debt they unwittedly accrued when they settled on Garan a planet already owned by someone else. Asha has lived her whole life in Goran, eking out an existence between factory assembly lines and constant terror, studying stolen aeronautic manuals in the dead of night and trying not to get herself killed for mouthing off to a guard. Then she discovers she has a sister imprisoned by the Emperor and is forced to make a choice, stay enslaved but relatively safe, or escape and risk everything in the name of family. Obi is a time traveler sick with a legendary disease, Armed only with his prosthetic arm, his ever-constant melancholy, and the humour he uses to mask it, he has spent years travelling through time and space in search of a cure for the sickness currently unmaking him limb by limb. His mandate, find a cure 
go home and maybe figure out along the way if the prince he thinks sometimes he might love could be that home. When Obi saves Asha's life, they make a pact. Both will do all they can to get the other to the Emperor's stronghold unscathed. With the reluctant aid of Z Xavier, a mouthy deckhand with a mysterious past, <laughs> mysterious past, Ashi and Obi attempt to navigate a galaxy that hates them to find the things they both believe will make them whole. But a prophecy has started that has other plans, and not only is Asha forced to make a terrible choice, she must soon reckon with the legacy of an ancient religion and its heroes, who may be awakening, reincarnated in ways beyond her comprehension. Pass. Number 19, The Landing by Mary Gentle. Eris is NASA's acting director of the New Earth Object Lab, overseeing the transit of a large unidentified object passing Earth's orbit. She trained and worked all her life for this. She couldn't be more ready. But the object changes trajectory. What was one object becomes three, seven, nineteen. Nineteen different modules land across the planet. When the nearest module creates a dome and leaves Eris stranded within its confines, she's left to wander in search for safety. But things are stranger than she could have guessed, and she soon discovers she's not the only one wandering the alien landscapes under the domes. Alongside her 106 year old grandmother, a displaced imam, the president of the United States and her bodyguard, Eris must find a way home before they run out of water, food and ideas. The question is, when every direction reveals new and strange geographies, which way is the right way to go? Smash! That one seemed pretty interesting. At number 20, we have Pluto Shine by Lucy Kissick. Terraforming, the mega scale engineering of a planet's surface to one more Earth like, is now commonplace across the solar system, and Pluto's is set to be the most ambitious transformation yet. 4 billion miles from the sun and 200 degrees below zero, what this world let needs is light and heat. Through captured asteroids and solar mirrors, humanity's finest scientists and engineers are set to deliver them. What nobody factored in was a saboteur. But who and why? From the start, terraformer Lucian is intrigued by nine-year-old Nao, traumatized to muteness after a horrifying incident that shook the base and upended her family into chaos. If he could reach her, perhaps he could understand what happened that day, and what she knows about the secrets of Pluto. For now possesses unspoken knowledge, something that could put a stop to the terraforming. But crippled by her fears, and unable to trust her family, there is no one she can talk to. Only through Lucian's gentle friendship does she start to rediscover her voice, and what she has to say will transform our sense of place in the universe. I'm going to smash this one. Although I kind of feel like I already know the ending. Kind of see where that's going. Number 21, we have Stringers by Chris Panacea. Again, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Ben isn't exactly a genius, but he has an immense breadth of knowledge. Whether it's natural science, specifically the intricacies of bug sex, or vintage timepieces, he can spout facts and information with the best of experts. He just can't explain why he knows any of it. Another thing he knows is the location of the chime. What it is or why it's important, he can't say. But his knowledge is about to get him in a whole heap of trouble as a trash-talking flesh construct bounty hunter is on his tail and looking to sell him to the highest bidder. And being able to describe the mating habits of Brazilian bark lice won't be enough to get him out of it. Mmm, pass. Number 22, Thread a War by Gerald Brandt. His second book of a groundbreaking sci-fi series introduces an alternate Earth where powerful threads can alter reality as we know it. After almost a year, the gate between worlds has opened again, and through it Darwin hears the anguished screams of Teresa, the love he left behind. He returns to her world, one where quantum threads can change or control reality, and ordinary people can do extraordinary things. But nothing is as he left it. The threads, though still plentiful, no longer respond the way they once had. Groups of threaders must work together to perform even the simplest of tasks. Yet the Cabal continue to grow and create skens to do their bidding. With the changes, war has returned to the world, pitting the Cabal against threaders of Safehaven and Forsyth. With the weakened threads and the increase in skens, Safehaven is losing. Darwin's return is greeted with hatred by some and worship by others, all for the same reason. He changed the world by turning off the source. Darwin needs to find Teresa and reverse what he has done before the Cabal take away everything he loves about the world he has entered. 
Smash. Number 23, Eclipse the Moon by Jessie Mahillik. Jessie Mahillik, didn't we have something from her earlier? Yeah. Number seven, Hunt the Stars by Jessie Mahillik. Key has been many things, hacker, soldier, bounty hunter. She never expected to be a hero, but when a shadowy group of traitors starts trying to goad the galaxy's two superpowers into instigating an interstellar war, Key throws herself into the search to find out who is responsible and stop them. Digging up hidden information is her job, so hunting traitors should be a piece of cake. Pass. Whenever I hear um, cliches in the blurb, it doesn't bode well for the book in my opinion. Number 24, Under Fortunate Stars by Red Hutchings. Fleeing the final days of the generation's long war with the alien felon, smuggler Jareth Keevan's freighter the Jonah breaks down in a strange rift in deep space, with little chance of rescue until they encounter the research vessel Galleon, which claims to be from 152 years in the future. The Galleon's chief engineer, Uma, has always been fascinated with the past, especially the tale of the Fortunate Five, who ended the war with the Felon. When the Galleon rescues a run-down junk freighter, Azaka is shocked to recognise the Five's legendary ship, and the Five's famed leader, Eldrick, among the crew. But nothing else about Eldrick and his crewmates seem to match up with the historical record. With their ships running out of power in the rift, more than the lives of both crews may be at stake. Uh, pass. Number 25, Breaking Day by Adam Oyobenji. On a generation ship for a distant star, one engineer in training must discover the secrets at the heart of the voyage in this new sci-fi novel. It's been over a century since three generation ships escaped an Earth dominated by artificial intelligence in pursuit of a life on a distant planet orbiting Tau Ceti. Now it's nearly breaking day, when the ships will begin their long-awaited descent to their new home. Born on the lower decks of the Archimedes, Ravi McCloyd is an engineer in training set to be the first of his family to become an officer in the stratified, hi in the stratified hierarchy aboard the ship. While on routine inspection, Ravi sees the impossible, a young woman floating helmetless out in space, and he's the only one who can see her. As his visions of the girl grow more frequent, Ravi is faced with a choice, secure his family's place among the elite members of the Archimedes crew, or risk it all by pursuing the mystery of the floating girl. With the help of his cousin, Boz, and her illegally constructive AI, Ravi must investigate the source of these strange visions and uncover the truth of the Archimedes' departure from Earth before breaking day arrives and changes everything about life as they know it. Smash! That seems pretty interesting. I like that. Number 26, The Stranded by Sarah Daniels. A gripping near-future thriller. Love triangles, betrayals, and fights for freedom in a world turned upside down. Welcome to Arcadia. Once a luxurious cruise ship, it became a refugee camp after being driven from Europe by an apocalyptic war. Now it floats near the coastline of the Federated States, a leftover piece of the fractured USA. For 40 years, residents of Arcadia have been prohibited from making landfall. It is a world of extreme haves and have-nots, gangs and makeshift shelters. Esther is a loyal citizen, working flat out to have a rare chance to live a normal life as a medic on dry land. Ben is a rebel, planning something big to liberate Arcadia once and for all. When events throw them both together, their lives and the lives of everyone on the ship will change forever. Pass. Number 27, The Sleepless by Victor Manibo. In a near future New York City where the minority of the population has lost the need for sleep, a journalist fights to uncover the truth behind his boss's murder on the eve of a sinister corporate takeover, while his own sleeplessness spirals out of control. A mysterious pandemic causes a quarter of the world to permanently lose the ability to sleep, without apparent health implications. The outbreak creates a new class of people who are both feared and ostracised, most of whom optimise their extra hours to earn more money. Jamie Vega, a journalist at CP Media, is one of the sleepless. When his boss Simon dies in a suicidal overdose, Jamie doesn't buy this too convenient explanation especially given its suspicious timing during a controversial merger, and investigates. As Jamie delves deep into Simon's final days, he tangles with extremist organisations and powerful corporate interests, and must confront past traumas and the unforeseen consequences of being sleepless. He soon faces the most dangerous decision of all, as he uncovers a terrifying truth about sleeplessness that imperils him and all of humanity. Smash! That is a good concept. I like that. At number 28, and the penultimate on this extremely long list, 
is Black Tide by Casey Jones. Casey Jones' Black Tide, a character-driven sci-fi horror novel that explores what happens after a cataclysmic event leaves the world crawling with nightmares. A story with a cinematic feel, Black Tide is Cujo meets a quiet place. It was just another day at the beach, and then the world ended. Mike and Beth didn't know each other existed before the night of the meteor shower. A melancholy film producer and a house sitter barely scraping by, chance made them neighbours. A bottle of champagne brought them together, and a shared need for human connection sparked something more. After a drunken and desperate one-night stand, the two strangers awake to discover a surprise astronomical, a pass. Number 29, and the last on this list. Thank you so much if you have made it this far. Number 29, The Damage Done by Michael Landweber. Perfect for fans of Ben Winters and Sarah Pinkska. Violence is a thing of the past but could new horrors lie in wait? Imagine a world devoid of violence, a world where fists can't hit, guns don't kill, and bombs can't destroy. In this tantalizing novel of possibility, this has become our new reality. The US president must find a new way to wage war. The Pope ponders whether the commandment of thou shalt not kill is still relevant. A dictator takes his own life after realizing that the violence he used to control his people is no longer an option. In the first days after the change, seven people who have experienced violence struggle to adapt to this radical new paradigm. Dab, a bullied middle schooler. Marcus, a high school student whose brother is the last victim of gun violence in America. Anne, a social worker stuck in an abusive marriage. Richard, a professor whose past makes him expect the worst in the present. Gabriella, who was making a dangerous border crossing into the US. The Empty Shell, a dissident writer awaiting to be tortured in a notorious prison, and Julienne, a white supremacist plotting a horrific massacre. As their fates intertwine, the things each of the seven experience become emblematic of the promise and perils of the new world. The future holds bright new possibilities for ending terrorism, racism, and even hatred itself. But although violence is no longer possible, that doesn't mean that some among us won't keep trying. Mindless cruelty is still alive and well, and those bent on destruction will seek the most devious means to achieve it. Smash! That is an interesting concept. So that's the end of my 2022 Smash or Pass list. I hope you got lots of reading inspiration for the year ahead. I know I have. Let me know which books piqued your interest in the comments, or which books were a hard pass for you. Until next time guys, happy reading.